This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. The Senate is voting right now and it's looking like they'll pass a bill to avoid a partial government shutdown tonight. The deadline is tonight at midnight and the Senate advanced the bill earlier today. This is the funding package that passed the House earlier this week. There it passed easily with enough support from both Republicans and Democrats, although notably not the Freedom Caucus. It's for over $460 billion to fund agriculture, transportation, housing, Housing, energy, veterans, and other programs. President Biden's State of the Union address has provided very different reactions from lawmakers. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez has more on what representatives from each party had to say. Last night's State of the Union address was one of only two State of the Union speeches not delivered on the months of January and February in the last 30 years. Similarly, it has been decades since a sitting president delivered a State of the Union address during an election year, with the opposing party having virtually already decided on a presidential candidate. For Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar, the Republican from Florida, this year's State of the Union address had a completely different tone than in previous years. It was a political speech, and you don't, you don't do political speeches when you are talking to the nation. You're explaining to the nation what you did during your four years. Basically, what Biden was doing is just trying to do a, a campaign speech, trying to convince the voters that everything is good. The Congresswoman also highlighted her discomfort at the president's criticism of the Supreme Court during his State of the Union address. In this country, you do not, do not, do not criticize the Supreme Court because that's and the Constitution and that is one of the branches that assures that we have the fantastic system that we have. So don't mess with the Supreme Court. Congressman Michael Bast, the Republican from Illinois, admitted he left the State of the Union early. I don't have to sit there and watch the garbage and... It really was a campaign speech. House Democrats had a completely different reaction to the president's speech. Democratic Congressman Steny Hoyer applauded the president's foreign policy focus, something Republicans decried. Look, I think the president is doing exactly the right thing. A, uh, he said that Israel needs to defeat Hamas. Uh, Hamas has been uh, terrorizing Israel for a long period of time. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries praised the president's immigration plan during today's press conference, but unlike the president, refused to mention the name Lakin Riley, the 22-year-old nursing student murdered in Georgia by an illegal immigrant. Comprehensive vision for uh, fixing our broken immigration system and addressing the challenges at the border. He also acknowledged the horrific nature of the murder and of course emphasize the need more generally to keep our community safe. After last night's speech, President Biden hit the campaign trail and is expected to visit eight battleground states within the next month. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Former President Trump posted a nearly $92 million bond in a New York court on Friday. The bond will prevent E. Jean Carroll from receiving the $83 million penalty, while Trump appeals the jury's verdict. NTD's legal correspondent Arlene Richards has more on that and other Trump trial updates. Apparently, former President Trump has enough cash and collateral to post a nearly $92 million bond. The bond provided by Federal Insurance Company covers Trump's judgment in the E. Jean Carroll defamation case. And somehow we're going to have to fight this up. A jury ordered that Trump pay $83.3 million in damages to Carroll for defamation after he denied her sexual assault allegations. The nearly $92 million is 110 percent of the judgment value and must be posted during the appeal process. Trump's attorney Alina Habba said in a statement that she was highly confident that an appeals court will overturn this egregious judgment. On Thursday, Judge Lewis Kaplan denied Trump's request to extend the payment date, which put pressure on the former president to post the bond before the Monday deadline. And now that he has posted the bond, Judge Kaplan said in a Friday order that Ms. Carroll can oppose it. I don't even know who this woman is. He's allowing Carroll to file opposition by 11 a.m. on March 11th. 
Meanwhile, on March 25th, Trump will have to post a bond of $454 million if he's going to appeal the judgment in New York's civil fraud case. As well as participating in a conspiracy to obstruct justice. Special counsel Jack Smith pushes back on a number of Trump motions to dismiss the classified documents case. Smith charged former President Trump with taking classified national defense documents from the White House after he left office. In a 27-page filing on Thursday, he argued that Trump should not be granted presidential immunity from alleged crimes that occurred after his term of office. Trump has argued that his decision to remove the records from the White House was an official act that occurred while he was still in office. Smith asked the judge to certify Trump's claim for immunity as frivolous and accused Trump of raising the immunity defense solely for the purpose of delaying the trial. Judge Eileen Cannon has scheduled a hearing for March 14th. A D.C. Circuit Court gives another Capitol Police officer a free pass to sue former President Trump. An order issued by a three-judge panel on Friday automatically granted an appeal filed by a Capitol Police officer and two others. The court said the issues raised are the same as those in a case brought by a different officer who claimed Trump incited a riot on January 6. In that case, Chief Judge Sri Srinivasan ruled that Trump lacked presidential immunity. Arlene Richards, NTD News. Trump has just won the support of New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu. The governor previously endorsed Nikki Haley, but now that she's dropped out, he's backing Trump over Biden. And Trump-endorsed candidate Michael Watley has been elected as the new chair of the Republican National Committee. He took over the gavel from Ronna McDaniel at the committee's spring meeting today. The committee also appointed Trump's daughter-in-law, Laura Trump, as the co-chair. I would like to thank President Trump for his trust and support. There is no one who has been more focused on fighting for the American people. And I am grateful for the opportunity to work with him to win and help revitalize our great nation. I know how important this role is, and it is truly an honor to be here to work alongside all of you. We have one goal. The goal on November 5th is to win And as my father-in-law says, big league, we're going to win on November 5th. The decision follows Trump's strong performance in the Super Tuesday primaries and the withdrawal of his last rival, Nikki Haley, for the nomination. The former president has also pushed for two senior advisors, Chris Lasavita and James Blair, to fill key positions at the RNC. An update on the tragic death of nursing student Lakin Riley. A new report says that the illegal immigrant suspected of killing her is part of a violent gang. NTD's Arianne Pazdar has more from the southern border. In 2022, Jose Ibarra entered the United States illegally through the southern border. Now in 2024, he allegedly killed nursing student Lakin Riley. Now just today, the New York Post reports that Ibarra is part of a violent street gang from Venezuela called Tren de Aragua. Now the Post is citing anonymous sources saying that when Ibarra entered, he was detained. He was arrested for shoplifting later in New York City, but his background was never checked. I recently spoke with San Diego County Supervisor Jim Desmond. Let's take a look at what he told me about his talks with Border Patrol regarding background checks. What do you do to vet these people before they come across to make sure they're not criminals or they're not terrorists? What do you, what do, you do? And they said, unfortunately, the answer was very little because the only database that they have to, to check someone's background is a U.S. database. You know, if they were in their own country and the embassies applying there, we could use, use the databases there to find out if somebody has any criminal background at all. Now, Texas Senator Ted Cruz on Friday blamed President Biden for Lake and Riley's death. That's partly because the administration is not conducting these background checks we just heard about. This might leave you wondering why so many people are allowed to freely come into the country. The mayor of El Cajon, California, Bill Wells, told me what he thinks the reason is. It really comes down to one thing, and that is the more people that come in, the bigger the census numbers are for that area. The blue areas like Chicago and New York will get more House seats, which will change the the balance of power in Washington. And what they're hoping is it will change the balance of power forever and in a way that can never be caught up. Now, Democrats, of course, have a different take on this. They often say they just want to help people in need. 
and that many of the immigrants coming to the U.S. are suffering persecution in their home countries. Reporting from San Diego, California, Ariane Pastar, NTD News. Residents in the Gaza Strip are facing daily struggles to find basic necessities such as food and water. Now, new efforts are underway to address the humanitarian aid crisis. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. And a warning, this report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. Humanitarian aid has become a significant issue in the Gaza Strip, and countries are trying a variety of ways to get more aid into the war-torn territory. During President Biden's State of the Union address on Thursday, he addressed the situation. Tonight, I'm directing the U.S. military to lead an emergency mission to establish a temporary pier in the Mediterranean on the coast of Gaza that can receive large shipments carrying food, water, medicine, and temporary shelters. The U.S. is teaming up with the European Union and the United Arab Emirates to get a maritime corridor for humanitarian aid in operation. The humanitarian aid will start at a port in Cyprus before it is shipped to Gaza. Cyprus's president spoke on Friday. The Cyprus Maritime Corridor aims at scaling up aid by complementing other routes. It is also clear that we are at a point where we simply have to unlock all possible routes. A Pentagon spokesperson said it could take several weeks to build the port. One of the newest routes has been by air, with several countries, including the United States, airdropping tons of humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip. But during a recent airdrop, one of the parachutes didn't deploy, causing a pallet to nearly free fall, resulting in the death of five people. That's according to a journalist who was on the scene and the head of an emergency room at a Gaza hospital. The Pentagon confirmed that all U.S. aid bundles landed safely on the ground and have not caused civilian casualties. And at the same time, the war rages on as Israeli troops try to defeat the Iran-backed Hamas terrorist group. On Thursday night, Israel Defense Forces said a number of rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip toward Israel. And within minutes, the IDF struck the sources of the launches, a weapon storage facility, a military compound, and a tunnel shaft. Residents in the Gaza Strip are often caught in the crossfire, including this 11-year-old girl. The wall fell on top of me. I was injured. I was screaming. The man brought a hammer, broke the wall, and pulled us out. Meanwhile, in Jerusalem on Friday, Thousands of people participated in a marathon as a tribute to Israeli soldiers, security forces, and rescue workers who have been at the front lines of the war. And they also called for an immediate release of the more than 100 hostages still held captive by Hamas. Jason Perry, NTD News. Another incident involving a passenger jet this morning. A Boeing 737 operated by United Airlines rolled off the runway at George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston. The passengers were transported by bus to the terminal after what became United's third major incident this week. Entity's Andrew Thomas has the latest. The FAA did not report any injuries Friday after the United flight came to rest on the grass. The incident comes just days after the FAA proposed an airworthiness directive affecting more than 200 U.S. registered Boeing 737 airplanes. On Thursday, another United Airlines flight bound for Japan didn't go as expected. The Boeing 777 made a safe landing in Los Angeles after losing a tire while taking off from San Francisco. The tire landed in an employee parking lot at San Francisco International Airport, smashing into a car and shattering its back window. The debris crashed through a fence and came to a stop in a neighboring lot. An airport spokesman said no one was injured. On Monday, a United flight from Houston to Fort Myers was forced to turn around after one of the plane's engines caught fire. Several of the 167 passengers on board the Boeing 737 took video, showing flames shooting out of the engine. The plane landed back in Houston just 33 minutes after takeoff. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. A protest at the Malaysian embassy in Beijing today, 10 years after the mysterious disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370, families of Chinese passengers on the plane are still seeking the truth about what happened. Our hope is that if he is alive, we need to see him in person. If he is dead, we need to see his body. What happened to the plane? Where did it go? 
find the plane as soon as possible. Malaysia says it's willing to reopen an investigation if compelling new evidence emerges. Flight MH370 disappeared on the way from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing 10 years ago on March 8th with 239 people on board. What happened to the flight has become one of the world's greatest aviation mysteries. Hong Kong is moving to enact harsher penalties against pro-democracy politicians, activists and anyone deemed to be colluding with so-called foreign forces. Lawmakers published their draft of a new national security law today. The bill includes penalties of up to life in prison for treason, insurrection and sabotage. It also proposes 20 years in jail for espionage and 10 years for crimes linked to state secrets and sedition. The bill also proposes extending police detention for individuals arrested without charge from 48 hours to 14 days. Human rights and media advocacy groups says it has the potential to silence journalists and freedom of expression. The European Union says it has grave concerns over the sweeping provisions in the bill and its extraterritorial reach. The U.S. has also expressed concern over the bill's broad and vague definitions of state secrets and external interference. Several members of Hong Kong's largely pro-Beijing body said they expect the bill to become law before mid-April. In last night's State of the Union address, President Biden said the U.S. wants competition with China, but not conflict. We hear now from retired Air Force General Robert Spaulding, who says the Chinese Communist Party is waging global political warfare against the U.S. and using TikTok as a weapon. General Spaulding, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks. Great to be back. Now, President Biden delivered the State of the Union last night, and he touched on foreign policy, specifically China. I want to play a clip now. And we're standing up against China's unfair economic practices. We're standing up for peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits. And we're in a stronger position to win the conflict of the 21st century against China than anyone else for that matter, than any time as well. What is your reaction to that? You know, um, President Biden, you know, and, and really kept going with a lot of the policies that President Trump uh, implemented uh, in during his administration. So I actually applaud him for that. That being said, I think it's very clear that it's been very slow and it is it needs to be much more rapid and much more involved. They've shut down things like the Department of Justice going after people, you know, Chinese nationals who were spying on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. So they've slowed down numerous programs. They haven't done enough in things like fentanyl. So there's a lot more bad news uh, with regard, regard to the border, obviously, and kind of continuous bad news on fentanyl when it comes to Biden. But there is also bad news under Trump. And I think the reason is, is because the Chinese Communist Party has influenced our corporate sector, our financial sectors, and in turn, those sectors influence politics in Washington, D.C. Now, if we do see a second Trump term, how do you see Trump handling the China issue? (laughs) The Chinese Communist Party basically went all in on Biden in 2020. So I think I can see a Trump administration retaliating against the Chinese Communist Party for that. And I think here the parties go after each other and, you know, the Chinese Communist Party benefits from that. So if you can get somebody that actually understands politics more so than combat, which is where we think national security should be right now, but it's really not. It's in global political warfare, which is what the Chinese Communist Party wages then I think we have a better chance, quite frankly, of dealing with the Chinese Communist Party. You know, because these things like TikTok are a big, big problem, and they are a weapon in that global political warfare campaign. Speaking of TikTok, the House Committee on Energy and Commerce unanimously approved two bills against TikTok. Now, TikTok's response was to up its lobbying efforts, and then lawmakers were reporting that their phone lines were being drowned with calls from middle schoolers calling them not to ban the app. What do you make of all of that? Well, it's exactly, you know, what we expected to see from TikTok, and they have enormous pull, you know, 30% 30% of young people now get their news from TikTok. Uh, they have influence. The American Marketing Association has gone 
all in into TikTok. They teach you know marketers how to use TikTok to you know sell their products. So this is a big problem for the United States. It's basically being embedded in the bloodstream, and it is a political warfare weapon. And you saw it unleashed on behalf of keeping TikTok alive within the United States. So the more it gets into the bloodstream, the more influence the Chinese Communist Party is going to have on the American people. And that means the more influence they're going to have on our political system. So when you're talking about national security, it's really about political independence and sovereignty. TikTok is a weapon for China, the Chinese Communist Party, to undermine the political and independence and sovereignty of the United States. It is way more powerful than a B2 and a bomb. This tool can go directly at the citizens, and therefore you can directly affect the political outcomes of that nation. This is extremely dangerous for a democracy, and quite frankly, it's why the Chinese Communist Party is so good at controlling China. I want to delve into that. So given that TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, is Chinese and has ties to the Chinese Communist Party, give us a sense of what is the issue here? Is it literally foreign interference in our elections? Absolutely. The algorithms that ByteDance uh, has basically mine the data that comes out of TikTok. So it's basically a television that's watching you, watching all of how you interact with it, everything that you do with your device, take sending it to ByteDance in China. They use other algorithms to come back at you and bring you content that gets you hooked on it. And then they can use that to manipulate you in just the ways that we talked about in the very beginning. So it's a political influence tool. Now, it uses the technology developed in Silicon Valley. It uses the mobile internet. It uses open data. It uses AI. These are things that we developed, but they've harnessed them in different ways, in ways that are supportive of authoritarian regimes. And and quite frankly, a, a way that's never been seen before. It used to be you had to put a gun to people's heads to get them to believe in the system. Now we just automatically cut them off from services, cancel them for things so that they do the things that you want them to do just by virtue of if they don't, they can't survive in the society. And so it's really ingenious. It's filtering over now into the free world, and it's affecting who we are as a people and as a nation. Quite concerning indeed. General Spaulding, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Well, the new RNC leadership helped Trump. To discuss, we spoke with Brianna Lyman, elections correspondent for The Federalist. Brianna Lyman, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Now, the Republican National Convention has new leadership, Michael Watley and Laura Trump, both of whom former President Trump endorsed. Now, given that, what direction do you see the RNC going with this new leadership? Well, this is beneficial for Donald Trump. First of all, having his daughter-in-law as co-chair does really mean that the MAGA movement will be alive and well in the RNC, even more so than it was. Now, Michael Watley in particular, you know, he's been heralded by his supporters as someone who upholds election integrity. And this is something that Donald Trump has spoken about since the 2020 race, and that he wants to have safer, uh, safer measures put in place, where he wants voter ID. He wants to make sure absentee ballots are counted only if they're valid, things like that. And that's something that Michael Wally has worked on. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, you do have some critics who have told me uh, at The Federalist that Michael Wally isn't going to be able to fundraise. And so I think the biggest concern that the RNC might have is even though they have someone fighting on the behalf of election integrity, will they be able to bring in the money like Ronda McDaniel? On that note, many have been saying that Trump has been doing very well in the Republican Party, but not so much when it comes to, say, the independents or even the Democrats. How do you see this new leadership at the RNC maybe helping to get some of those voters? Well, I think North Carolina is a great example, and, and picking Michael Wally, who's from North Carolina, is great because North Carolina is, in some respects, a purple state. And it does take someone who's going to be able to reach across the aisle uh, and appeal to all sects of the Republican Party. And I think a lot of independent voters, if you look at the trends, they aren't necessarily ruling out voting for Republican, right? They have conservative principles, but they don't know if Donald Trump is the person for them. So having someone like Michael Watley who can appeal to people who are, you know, further right more and more towards the middle uh, and bring them together will definitely help the long run. Now, given all the tensions we are seeing around the world, foreign policy has been pushed to the forefront a lot. Michael Watley has said that the world is in a, quote, much more dangerous place than it was four years ago. How do you see this change in the RNC leadership potentially helping or impacting a potential second Trump term? 
Well, something that Michael Watley has done and put together is something called the Judicial Victory Fund. Uh, and that was basically getting a bunch of lawyers and volunteers to litigate uh, in North Carolina in particular their uh, Supreme Court races and other judicial races. And so if Michael Watley is able to translate that to the RNC and have a a group of lawyers ready come election day to challenge any improprieties that may pop up, that could land Donald Trump in the White House next year. Now, switching gears a bit, President Biden last night gave his State of the Union address. He mentioned his predecessor a lot, as in Trump. What did you make of his speech? Uh, for, you know, the Constitution, it says that from time to time, the president will give an update on the State of the Union. And what President Biden did last night is he gave a campaign speech. Because if he gave an update on the State of the Union, he wouldn't have been screaming and, and trying to make things seem so honky-dory, right? It would have been a somber tone. It would have said, America, I understand the problems you're facing. I know the economy feels poor. I know you're scared about the southern border. And I know you're scared about the money we're sending to places like Ukraine. I hear you. And my administration is working to address that, right? And instead, he got up there and he insulted Americans and told them, basically, if you don't like what you see now, basically, you know, screw off. And Republicans took umbrage with that. You could see it in their facial expressions, including uh, Mike Johnson. Brianna Lehman, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. And now with some historical analysis on how the State of the Union address might affect President Biden's approval rating is NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, what have you got for us? Thank you, Tiff. You know, President Biden's uh, latest job approval rating, according to Gallup, we'll bring her up right here, just 38% was a 59% disapproval rating. That's actually very low. That's just above the 37% he hit several times last year as the lowest of his administration. But, you know, he had an audience last night to, uh, to tout some of his highlights in his speech and maybe make a difference. Now, we won't immediately know if his speech made a huge difference and helped him out, but we can look back at history. But first, let's actually start with Donald Trump and take a look at his last two State of the Union addresses. Here's Trump's job approval before and after his State of the Union address in 2019. As you can see here, 37% before and then up to 44% amazingly afterwards. Meanwhile, in 2020, you get one on February 4th. No change there, 49% to 49%. Now, it should be noted in 2019 that there was a government shutdown that ended on January 25th, just a couple days before that polling end that might have influenced this. Meanwhile, these 49% here, these are the high point of the Trump era. This was about as good as it got. Now, how about for Biden? Let's take a look at Biden's last two. These are his last two State of the Union addresses. These are the numbers before and afterwards. He gave one March 1st, 2022. 41% before, just 42% afterwards. Ditto for 2023, he gave one on February 7th. Again, 41% before, 42% afterwards. Now it should be noted, Biden's approval rating has actually not been above 43% since September of 2021. It's been quite a while. Now as for last night though, CNN reported that six in 10 Americans who watched it had a positive reaction, though they, though they do caution that these polls actually can be skewed because those who watch it are usually disproportionately for the same party. So it's a friendly audience. It could be a friendly score. Now, one president who had the biggest bump ever after giving a State of the Union address was Bill Clinton back in 1998. His approval rating went from 59% to 69%. Now this was at a time where the Monica Lewinsky scandal had just blown up on him and he was looking at a possible impeachment, but Clinton was also a very gifted speaker. Now that 10 point jump is not in line with history. On average, presidents see a bump of maybe 0.2% and actually you are just as likely to see your job approval rating go up as you were to go down. So based on the data, actually, the State of the Union addresses really have very little effect, as it turns out, on their job approval rating. But shifting gears a bit, let's take a look at the race of who might be giving the State of the Union address come 2025. Now, in the GOP primary, Trump really has no competitors left, but he still has to get to that magic number of 1,215 delegates. He's getting close. Let's take a look at the timeline to see when he'll actually get there. Now, officially, he is at 1,031 delegates won, so that's just maybe 186 away or 185, something like that. Today, there's actually the American Samoa uh, elections, nine delegates up for grabs there. 
Next Tuesday is a big one though, March 12, 161 delegates are up for grabs with four states going against Georgia, Hawaii, Mississippi, and Washington. Then a week from today, you've got Northern Mariana Islands, nine delegates up for grabs there. And a week from tomorrow, Guam has nine more. And then a week from Tuesday, five more state elections. We've got Arizona, Florida, Illinois, Kansas, Ohio, with 350 delegates up for grabs. This should be the day where Trump officially um, gets the nomination. NTD here, will be here to air it uh, on that night. That's all I've got. Tiffany, take it away. In his State of the Union address, President Biden touted the performance of the U.S. economy during his time in office. We asked several economists for their response to the president's statements. And geez, Virginia Gibson has more. My inherited economy is on the brink. Now our economy is literally the envy of the world. President Biden said the U.S. economy grew significantly during his time in office pointing to a record 15 million new jobs created, without mentioning the record job losses coming out of the forced COVID-19 lockdowns, and pointing to inflation dropping from 9% to 3%, the lowest in the world. The United States by rights has the economy that's the envy of the world, so that's not really saying anything about what the United States is supposed to be. Economist Brian Dimitrovic says the U.S. economy has always been the world's largest. He believes Biden's economy should be compared to Trump's economy economy from back in 2018. Dimitrovic says it was performing better back then. I want to cap prescription drug costs at $2,000 a year for everyone. Biden says he's price capped insulin for seniors. He says instead of paying $400 a month, they can now pay just $35 a month. And he wants to price cap prescription drugs on a far wider scale. Which sounds like a good idea and is a benefit to people that are buying those drugs. The problem is in the in the big picture, it's it's a big cost to the pharmaceutical com companies, which then can't afford to create new drugs. Economist Thomas Hogan says they won't have enough money for research and development. It takes around 14 years and billions of dollars worth of research to create new drugs. The United States is a world leader in medicine development. The entire global drug industry is oriented towards one market and one market only, the United States, because that's the only place a drug company can make any profit whatsoever. So um, you know, if we have real price caps on drugs in the United States, we can be sure that will be the end of the global drug industry. Dimitrovic says the world has piggybacked on the United States drug industry. He believes price caps would hurt the world. Pay your fair share in taxes. It's time to raise corporate minimum tax to at least 21%. Yes. I propose a minimum tax for billionaires of 25%. Biden wants to tax billionaires to fund child care and senior services and undo Trump's tax cuts for corporations. Those costs don't get borne by the stockholders of the corporations or the owners. They all get passed on to consumers in terms of higher prices and to workers in terms of lower wages and fewer jobs. Hogan says even Democratic economists are against these policies, but politicians use them as popular talking points. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Virginia Gibson, NTD News. The U.S. labor market is holding strong and steady. In its latest report, the Bureau of Labor Statistics said the economy added 275,000 jobs last month. That's a larger gain than economists expected. The unemployment rate grew as well from 3.7 percent to 3.9 percent. This is the 25th consecutive month. The nation's jobless rate has been below 4 percent. As for wages, the average hourly earnings inched up by 0.1 percent from December. That's slower than economists expected. The effects of high interest rates and persistent inflation may be starting to weigh on consumers. According to a report, Americans' credit scores are falling for the first time in a decade. NTD's Don Ma has the story. U.S. consumer credit scores are starting to buckle. The national average fell as of October, according to the latest data from FICO, an analytics company that evaluates the strength of borrowers. This drop is the first in a decade. It's another sign that some Americans are feeling financial stress. 
The FICO report noted that the effects of high interest rates and persistent inflation may be starting to weigh on consumers, especially those already struggling to manage their finances. FICO said the drop in credit scores in late 2023 was driven by an increase in Americans missing payments and also by rising debt levels. The last time credit scores fell was back in 2013. The vice president of FICO Scores and Predictive Analytics says that while the recent drop is a notable milestone, it's not a drastic decrease and not one that should sound an alarm. But besides the falling credit score, over 18% of the population had a 30-day or later past due payment on at least one credit account in the prior year, according to FICO. When consumers fail to repay their loans for a long time, banks write off the bad debt as a loss. Banks have increasingly been forced to do just that. The apparent cumulative impact of higher interest rates, elevated consumer prices, and economic uncertainty has put a financial strain, especially on those consumers who rely heavily on credit cards to cover everyday expenses, says the report. Don Ma, NTD News. Tired of political news and looking for a change of pace? Great news. NTD TV's first entertainment program premieres this Sunday. Join Ruby Lovell at the entertainment capital of the U.S. Los Angeles. This is your go-to source for all things Hollywood. Tune in for the first episode of Right on L.A. with Ruby Lovell this Sunday, March 10th, starting at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, right here on NTD News.